Amen. Thank you, Philip. Praise God. Uh, you can go ahead and open to 2 Corinthians 7. Uh, this is week three that I get to share this wonderful truth with you that God did not create you to live half-heartedly. He created you to live a life filled with purpose and meaning in a loving relationship with him, with an undivided heart for God. So week three, let's recap. Week one, I need your guys' help. Are you guys awake? Okay. Uh, undeserved blank deserves an blank heart. Undeserved what? Grace deserves an undivided. Oh, good. You guys are listening. Undeserved grace deserves an undivided heart. And last week, we, we talked about this, an undivided, this one should be easier, context clues. Heart, yes, is wide open to godly leadership. Whoever said that, awesome. Um, undivided heart is wide open to godly leadership. And today we shift our focus a bit on another paradox of Christian life. So the Christian life is full of paradoxes, right? The blessed are the poor. The first shall be last. If you want to find your life, lose it. Yeah, so here's another one. The best followers are the best leaders. The best followers are the best leaders. So last week we talked about being a follower of godly leadership. But then the truth is, if you do that, if you're a follower of God and a follower of godly leadership, you naturally become a godly leader yourself. Because we all have influence. And leadership, at its core, is just influence. You don't need a title. You don't need a position. You don't need to be authorized by some organization to be a leader. All it takes is influence. And we all have it. Every single one of us has it. Some of us have more influence. Some of us have less influence. Some of us use our influence for good. And some of us use our influence negatively. How are you using your influence? How are you doing that? Be when I say for good, I mean that you're using your influence to point other people to the only thing that matters in life. Loving God, loving people, and making disciples. And if I say you're using it for bad, it means you're, you're distracting them and dividing them from that one singular mission that we all have from Christ. How are you using your influence? Let's pray. God, we, we know from Scripture that only the Spirit of God comprehends the truth of God. No one comprehends the thought of God except the, the Spirit of God. So we humbly and boldly come to you asking for you to fill us with your Spirit so that we could learn and live out your spiritual truth. In King Jesus' name, God's children said, amen. amen. So Paul, maybe you know this about Paul, the author of this letter. He likes to go on rabbit trails. He goes on tangents. And I can relate to him because you're talking about God and then all of a sudden this other aspect of God comes up and you, it's a worthy digression. So I wanted to talk about that too. But it makes it really hard to teach like that, right? So we're going to handle this passage a little different than most Sundays, uh, we see this is the, the whole passage, this 2 through 16. We're going to focus today on verse 2 and verse 7, verse 2 to 7, and then 13 through 16. So next week, we'll come back to this rabbit trail. That is a very worthy tra rabbit trail. We'll discuss that. We'll talk about that. But for today, we're, we're skipping over it. Everybody with me? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to walk through these verses. And I'll make some observations and explanations, and I'll try to avoid my own rabbit trails. Okay? Starting in verse 2. Make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one, corrupted no one, taken advantage of no one. I don't say this to condemn you, since I already have said that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I am very frank with you. 
I have great pride in you. I am filled with encouragement, and I am overflowing with joy in all our afflictions. So what's Paul saying here? He's saying, I, I've been correcting you thus far, not to condemn you and sh- just say you're wrong, but because I love you and I want you to realize your own foolishness so that you can live a healthy, whole life. And I'm very frank with you. Some might say Paul is blunt, right? I'm very frank with you. I, have, I know I correct you to your face, but I brag about you to other people. I brag about how great you are and how you love God. And and so I'm filled with encouragement. I'm overflowing with joy, even in all my suffering. Sometimes when you read Paul, at least sometimes when I read him, I'm like, Paul, you're so gushy, so mushy. Come on, really? You're suffering and you're just filled with encouragement and overflowing with joy. Seriously? Your suffering must not be that bad then, if if you're just that, having that great of a time still. So what was Paul suffering? He he explains it in the next verse. Verse 5. In fact, when we came into Macedonia, we had no rest. Instead, we were troubled in every way, conflicts on the outside, fears within. So what were Paul's afflictions? No rest, trouble in every way, conflicts on the outside, so there's external conflicts all around him, and then internally, he's filled with fear. Can you relate? You have challenges? So how is he overflowing with encouragement and joy? How is that possible? How does he have the courage to continue living this life that takes great courage? And, and let's watch. Let's listen. Verse 6. He, he uh, explains all his trials, and then he says these two words. But God. But God. And I've come to really appreciate when, when Scripture puts these two words together. 23 times in the New Testament, it says, but God. And it's usually after this hopeless situation, dire, that leads to despair, but God. And this is a, a wonderful testimony. We should model this in our own lives. We, we should be able to say, I have all these challenges, but God. And then explain how God brings us hope. Explain how God is working all things for good. But God. But God who comforts the downcast. How does God comfort the downcast? How does he encourage the discouraged? Here's one way comforted us by the arrival of Titus. And not only by his arrival, but also by the comfort he received from you. He told us about your deep longing, your sorrow, and your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. So I want to look, I want to spend a couple minutes on this, and I want you to become the experts. How does God encourage the discouraged. How does God encourage his people? We all need courage, right? We all need to be encouraged. If we're going to live this life that Christ has called us to live, to die to ourselves, to live for him, we need courage to have convictions. We need to be encouraged. So how does God encourage us? And I want you to, to look at two things. Look at the source and then look at the messenger or the vessel uh, of the encouragement. Okay, we're going to look at the verse again. We're going to read it together. And you look for these two things, the source and the messengers. Ready? Read it out loud. But God. So who is the source? Who is the creator of all encouragement? Yeah, I'll give you a hint. God. God is the the, the creator of all encouragement. He is the source where, where we draw our encouragement from. But then there's messengers. 
There's vessels. Who are the vessels of this encouragement? Who are the people who deliver this encouragement for God? Titus is one, and the other one is the Corinthians. Yeah, you. He's talking about the Corinthians. So within these two verses, there is a massive theological truth that that we need to wrap our minds around. And that is on, on one hand, God is the creator of everything. He is the, the source of all good things, and he is sovereign. That means he's in control. He rules everything. He is powerful. He is the authority. But then God allows humans to have influence at the same time. He allows us to be messengers. He allows us to, to make choices. And he, he allows us to do the godly work of encouraging other people. Isn't that amazing that he allows humans to do godly work? And that we get to be a part of it? And so here's the, the big idea for today. God encourages his people through his people. And we see that really clearly in this text, right? God encourages his people through his people. So Titus goes to the Corinthian church, and he sees people living undivided for God. They have deep sorrow for their sin. They have a a zeal to follow God. They rejoice in what is good and right. And so Titus gets there, and he is encouraged by the Corinthians. He finds joy in what they're doing. And then Titus goes back to Paul. And what happens to Paul? He's encouraged by Titus being encouraged by the Corinthians. God encourages his people through his people. And this is amazing because God doesn't need our help, right? God could just give straight encouragement to Paul. But instead, he decides to use a group of people who influence one person who influences Paul. God allows us to be part of this godly work. So let's keep reading. Verse 13, remember we're skipping. Verse 13b, technically. In addition to our own comfort, we rejoiced even more over the joy Titus had because his spirit was refreshed by all of you. It's one big encouragement fest. Titus goes there, gets encouraged, comes back, and and Paul is rejoicing in in Titus' joy. Verse 14. For if I made any boast to him about you, I have not been disappointed. But as I have spoken everything to you in truth, so our boasting to Titus has also turned out to be the truth. And his affection toward you is even greater as he remembers the obedience of all of you and how you received him with fear and trembling. I rejoice that I have complete confidence in you. And and what Paul is telling the Corinthian church is that Because you all were so obedient to God, you refreshed Titus' spirit. Do you see the opportunity we have? When we are obedient to God, we can refresh other people's spirits. What a privilege. What a, a joy that we get to do that. And this is the truth, that you have influence. Are you using it to encourage or to discourage? And look at this word, encourage, right? It's the word courage with in, prefix in. The word courage comes from the Latin word core, which means heart. And in is a, is a prefix that is, has transitive value, a, a cause, it, it inputs, that transfers. So put them together, you're inputting heart to somebody. I'm in, when I encourage you, I'm enlarging your heart. I'm giving you a a, a growth where you can go and love and pour out from that. Encourage. It's a wonderful word picture. And then the opposite, on the flip side, is discourage. And dis is the prefix that means loss or take away and has this negative force to it. So when I discourage somebody, I'm taking their heart away. I'm causing it to shrink and shrivel and hide. So discouragement, if I discourage someone, that's a serious offense. 
that's a heavy burden that I'm going to cause your heart to shrink. And, and yet we so often casually discourage and cut other people down. Why do we do that? Why do I do that? We're called to be encouragers. We're called to encourage God's people. And, and the, the sad truth is when we live half-heartedly, though, it discourages other people. Indirectly or directly, half-hearted Christians discourage others. Half-hearted Christians discourage others. It's not hard to come up with examples of this, is it? Unfortunately. But I grew up going to church and I hear one thing about how, how you're supposed to live this way and delight in what God says is good and it's the best thing for you and follow this model of Jesus. And then I see Christians in my life that don't do that. And that I thought, well, it's not a priority to them, so why should it be a priority to me? And so when we're modeling not the life of Jesus, we're modeling to other people, it's okay. Live half-heartedly. And a a sad thing about half-heartedness is that it's cyclical. It repeats itself. So say you have a a family of, of three, just for this example. Say you have a family of three, and the father lives half-heartedly. Father lives half-heartedly for God. The husband lives half-heartedly for God. So then you have a wife that follows this model, lives half-heartedly. And then the son sees this and, and lives half-heartedly too. And so then the father, you come back to the father, and the father looks at his family, his half-hearted family, and is like, well, this is just how it is. And, and the cycle repeats. There needs to be something in there that stops that downward feedback loop. And and by the way, fathers, husbands, I start with you because you're called to be the spiritual leader. We need to break that cycle somehow. And the, the only way, but God. But God, only God can break that cycle of half heartedness. And that's what he did when he he wholeheartedly stepped into earth, taking on human flesh. Don't be a a discourager, be an encourager. Because the the flip side is wholehearted Christians encourage other Christians to live wholeheartedly. So as horrible as discouragement is, we get this other opportunity to encourage other people to live wholly for God. And that is a massive privilege. And there's two ways that this happens. Directly, we see this Titus direct encouragement to Paul. And indirectly, we see the Corinthians influencing Titus who influences Paul. So we'll start with the more obvious way, directly. It's really easy to be directly encouraged. You just, somebody comes up to you and gives you a a wonderful, sincere compliment. Or... One of my Tituses this week was my wife. I, I woke up Friday, and I just woke up tired. You know those days where you wake up feeling worn out? And, and I, just, I had breakfast, and then I just sit down on the couch. I didn't want to get up. I didn't want to do anything. I had a lot to do. And so my wife comes, sits by me, and she asks, do you want to do my study with me? And she's studying through the book of Philippians. And I say, sure. And so she reads the passage, and we answer these questions together. And she closes in prayer for me. And as I'm listening to her pray, she's spilling her heart out to God. And then she prays for me, prays for strength. And in that moment, I felt my spirit rejuvenated, that I felt a new sense that I'm, I could embrace today and embrace the challenges set out in front of me. And there's a, a new willingness, a new desire, and she was my Titus. Praise the Lord. You could be Titus for someone. You could be a bunch of people's Tituses. And it very directly, she encouraged me. But then the, let's move to the, the, the less direct way, the less obvious way that we 
are encouragers to others when we live wholeheartedly. Um, actually, I don't want to skip this. It's really good. One of my favorite quotes. Uh, one of my favorite authors has a quote about parenting, but it it's really applies to any situation. It really applies to any relationship. Wholehearted people, wholehearted people help other people believe that they are valuable. You know the best way to help other people believe they're valuable? Value them. Yeah, you, you, when you talk to them, you look at them in the eyes, you listen to them, you experience, if they're mourning, you mourn with them. You experience pain with them. Or if they're celebrating, celebrate with them. You enter into their world. You're valuable. You, you can have my attention. You can have my time. That's how valuable you are. And, and one of my favorite authors has this quote that it totally applies to this. You can't play patty cake very well when your mind is elsewhere. And if you can only play patty cake half-heartedly, you are running the risk of having a half-hearted child. If you cannot enter into the, to another person's world, you're telling them you're not worth my time. And you can't do this for everyone, obviously. But there, there are people you can invest in and you should be investing in. When you treat somebody like they're valuable over and over again, they'll start to believe it. You treat someone like they're worthless over and over again, they'll start to believe it. Engage wholeheartedly. It's a wonderful opportunity you have for every person God puts in front of you in your path. You can encourage them to live wholeheartedly. Another indirect way, we'll go back, indirect way is that just by living and you watch other people's examples, you're encouraged to live wholeheartedly or not. More is caught than taught. You've probably heard that before. Watching somebody and watching how they live is just as inspirational as telling somebody what to do. And in fact, it's more, to model it is more important. And, and so I think one situation, one scenario that is applicable for everyone in here is that during worship services, so like right now, during singing worship together, I, I recently read this little book about a, a theology of worship, singing worship together, because it's a weird thing, isn't it? If you haven't thought about it, we get together, a bunch of us here are not musical people, we get together and we sing together. I don't do that anywhere else. It would be weird, but for church, it's just a tradition that we do. And I, start, I was wondering why we do that. We could spend our time any number of ways. Why do we do that? And I found out it's commanded in Scripture. Colossians 3, 15 and 16. And the purpose of it is not so I could have worship one-on-one -on -one time with me and God. That's the rest of the week. We come together and sing together for unity of the body to build each other up and worship God. We do it for each other as much as we do it for God. And as I was thinking about this, I was so convicted because that means the most sincere time of singing worship is not when you enjoy the music. It's when you're singing a song you don't prefer because you know it's helping someone else in the room. So you can use your influence during worship singing to either stand like a cold dead fish, how great thou art, like that is not inspiring. <laughs> or you can use it and worship anyway and encourage the other people around you to worship. It's, it's again, it's an indirect thing, but it's so Powerful when you get a group of people united, not because they all like the same music, that's never going to happen, but because they all worship the same God and want to encourage other people to do that sincerely too. I'm running out of time. I have a lot more to say. <laughs> um, I'll share this really quickly. In youth group, we've been doing this thing where we celebrate i got to move back because you all read that if I leave it up there. I don't blame you. 
We celebrate God's grace. We're celebrating social risks students take to share God's love and truth with other people. And, and it doesn't matter how it turns out. If they get rejected, awesome. We're going to celebrate that you risked for God anyway. Celebrate the obedience. The result is between that person and God. We're going to celebrate the heart that risks for him. And so every week I encourage students to stand up and share. And we've been sharing these things. And they say things like this. The Bible verse on my school notebook started a spiritual conversation with a classmate. And another person said this, I explained that salvation is by grace, not works, to someone in my class. And if you look at the picture, you see there's a line of students ready to share. Does that not encourage your heart to go take risks for God too? That is a wonderful thing. You could be a person in line. You could be the one ready to share your testimony and say, here are all my challenges, but God. And God is the difference maker. God is the, the, the breakthrough that, the, that changes the cycle of half-heartedness. I want to end with this video with the disclaimer that I'm not celebrating the actual movement in the video, but there's a lot to be learned. There's a lesson to be learned within it. Ladies and gentlemen, at TED, we talk a lot about leadership and how to make a movement. So let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons from it. First, of course, you know, a leader needs the guts to stand out and be ridiculed. <laughs> but what he's doing is so easy to follow. So here's his first follower with a crucial role. He's going to show everyone else how to follow. Now notice that the leader embraces him as an equal. So now it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Now there he is calling to his friends. Now if you notice that the first follower is actually an underestimated form of leadership in itself. It takes guts to stand out like that. The first follower is what transforms a lone nut into a leader. <laughs> And here comes a second follower. Now it's not a lone nut, it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. So a movement must be public. It's important to show not just the leader, but the followers, because you find that new followers emulate the followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people and immediately after, three more people. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point. Now we've got a movement. <laughs> so, Notice that as more people join in, it's less risky. So those that were sitting on the fence before now have no reason not to. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, but they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. So <laughs> over the next minute, you'll see all of the, uh, those that prefer to stick with the crowd because eventually they would be ridiculed for not joining in. And that's how you make a movement. But let's recap some lessons from this. So first, if you are the type, like the shirtless dancing guy, that is standing alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals. So it's clearly about the movement, not you. <laughs> okay, but we might have missed the real lesson here. The biggest lesson, if you noticed, did you catch it? Is that leadership is over glorified. That yes, it was the shirtless guy was first and he'll get all the credit, but it was really the first follower that transformed the lone nut into a leader. So as we're told that we should all be leaders, that would be really ineffective. If you really care about starting a movement, have the courage to follow and show others how to follow. And when you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first one to stand up and join in. And what a perfect place to do that, Ted. Thanks. <laughs> So that movement, their mission, seemed to be just random foolishness led by a random fool, right? I don't really know. Wasn't there. But for us, if you are a Christian, then you are the church, and you have the greatest mission of all time to, to love God, love other people, and make disciples. And what a reason to join in. There's nothing else that's going to matter for eternity except the glory of God. And you get to encourage other people to invest in this one thing that matters for eternity. I encourage you, use your influence, be the first follower and, and get on board so that it becomes more risky to not be on board than to, than to get in and follow Jesus. Uh, I, I, I can't encourage you enough with this truth. Let, 
And the only way this is possible, by the way, again, is the Holy Spirit living in us, working in us so that we are empowered to follow Christ. Let's pray. God, thank you for loving us wholehearted. You broke the the half-hearted cycle by sending your son. Holy Spirit, fill us and strengthen us so, so that we can be followers who jump in and emulate Christ. Lord, let us be rooted and grounded in love for you so that we can worship you fully because you deserve it and also so that we can build up your people around us. We love you. We pray this in King Jesus' name. God's children said, amen. Amen. And because there's so many worthy tangents, again, I encourage you to subscribe and you'll get a few messages from me this week about how to live life with an undivided heart for him.